Okay, I think we will get started. Gary, would you lead us in prayer, brother? <laughs> it's a conspiracy. <laughs> I like conspiracies. Evangelicals love conspiracies, haven't you noticed? Go ahead, brother. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you we can have a good time. We thank you that we can uh, rejoice in you. Um, thank you for your word. Just help Dave to explain your word well. Help us to apply it well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> we are continuing our study of the life of Christ. His life is divided in three periods of time, period of preparation, period of public ministry, and a period of sacrifice. We've already examined his period of preparation. And we're working our way through his period of public ministry. We have already examined his first year of public ministry as a year of obscurity. We're presently working through his second year as a year of popularity. And we've already examined his early Galilean ministry. He spent four months in Galilee during the uh, first four months of his uh, second year, his year of popularity. Uh, that ended when he went to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And when we returned to Galilee uh, from celebrating Passover in Jerusalem, he began his middle Galilean ministry. It'd be a very rich ministry. A lot of things are going to happen. And uh, the first event that took place after returning from Jerusalem to begin his middle Galilean ministry was he appointed his 12 apostles. And we talked about that recently. That was scene 54. Following that, in scene 55, he gave the Sermon on the Mount. A very long sermon. Matthew devotes three chapters to it, chapters 5, 6, and 7. And we spent some time over the last couple of lectures talking about the Sermon on the Mount because it's an exposition on Old Testament law. And uh, my effort was to try to help you get an understanding of what the law was all about because Christians in general tend to be confused about it. The uh, <clears throat> Sermon on the Mount opens with the Beatitudes. Uh, the Beatitudes are short statements that begin with the word blessed. And uh, there are eight or perhaps nine Beatitudes. You said, David, decide, eight or nine. The problem is Matthew gives us nine Beatitudes. But the eighth and the ninth are the same. They're repeats. So sometimes you get a list of nine Beatitudes because there were nine short statements that began with the word blessed. Sometimes people combine the eighth and the ninth, so you only end up with eight Beatitudes. In any event, we'll treat the eighth and ninth as one Beatitude. And so we're going to be treating the Beatitudes as being numbered as eight. Uh, the Beatitudes are short statements that begin with the word blessed. And as I pointed out, Matthew has nine or perhaps eight. Luke has four. The word beatitude comes from the Latin word beatus, which means blessed. And so really, we could call these the blesseds. Why do we call them the beatitudes? Because the scholars like the sound of the Latin more than the English. That's it. I know you thought it was going to be profound, didn't you? Some profound reason. No, it just sounds, rather than calling these blesseds, we call them the Beatitudes from the Latin. It just sounds better. And finally, the word blessed means happy or fortunate, fortunate or blissful. So what Jesus is saying is, let me tell you about a man who's blessed. He's going to give us nine, eight or nine types of individuals who are blessed, who are happy. And that's a good thing to learn about, isn't it? Wiersbe wrote, this was a powerful word, the word blessed, to those who heard Jesus that day. To them it meant divine joy and perfect happiness. The word was not used for humans. It, was, it described the kind of joy experienced only by the gods or the dead. Blessed implied an inner satisfaction and sufficiency that did not depend on outward circumstances for happiness. This is what the Lord offers to those who trust him. So the Sermon on the Mount opens with Beatitudes. The, these are short statements that begin with the word blessed. Matthew has uh, nine, but really eight different ones. The word Beatitude comes from the Latin beatus, which means blessed. And blessed means happy, fortunate, or blissful. 
Let's read through them. We'll read through Matthews 8. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of, righteous for, of, because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Continuing, blessed are, the, uh, are you when men insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That's the ninth and the previous one, blessed are, the, are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's the eighth, and then the ninth followed. The Beatitudes are filled with paradoxes. A paradox is a true statement that seems contradictory. It's a true statement that seems contradictory or even absurd. For example, the best way up is down. And you're looking at me because the scientific mind turned on. You said, that's ridiculous. To uh, uh, an aeronautical engineer, don't, if he believed that, you don't want him to build your plane. Don't want him to build your plane. The best way up is down. That's a paradox because it's true, but it's self-contradictory. What am I getting at? The best way up in the kingdom of God and in God's esteem is down in humility. So that's a true statement that seems contradictory. The best way up in the kingdom of God. This is the man I esteem, God said. The one I esteem is the one who's lowly and contrite in spirit. The best way up is down. Is that not true? It's absolutely true, though it seems contradictory. That's what a paradox is. A statement that's absolutely true but it seems contradictory or absurd. Another, the best way to live is to die. Now, outside of Christendom, that makes no sense. And that's a paradox. Why? Because the best way to live for Christ is to die to self. Check it out. That's what Philippians is about. The best way to live is to die. That's a paradox. Back to the the best way to go up is to go down. The best way to live is to die. That's what a paradox is. It's a contradictory statement that's true, but seems contradictory or absurd. And the Beatitudes are filled with paradoxes. Happy, happy, happy. Remember, that's what the blessed means. Happy, happy, happy is the man, Jesus said, who's poor. And the world says, are you crazy? Poor people are sad. Rich people are happy. No, Jesus said, blessed or happy are the poor. Happy are those who mourn. No, no, no. Happy are when I'm rejoicing and laughing, not when I'm mourning. Happy are the meek. Happy are the hungry. Happy are the thirsty. Happy are the persecuted. Happy are the insulted. Happy are those who are falsely accused. And you're saying, this is craziness. But this is what the Beatitudes are about. They're filled with paradoxes. To the natural mind, they make no sense. But in God's world, they make total sense. They're absolutely true in God's wor world. In fact, if you don't embrace these paradoxes, you're not going to be able to live the life God wants you to live. The world, to the world, these are not paradoxical. They're absurd. To the Christian, these are paradoxical. They, make, they are, seem to be contradictory, but they're true. All right. Follow the progression of thought. I'm going to run through all of them. We're going to examine each of these the attitudes individually, but what I want to try to do for a moment is look at them collectively as a group because there's a certain progression of thought that works their way through and the way Jesus delivered them. The, the Bible is amazing on many, many levels. Not only, if, for example, in the Beatitudes do we get information about these nine Beatitudes, attitudes that the Lord want us, wants us to be blessed by, but even the order in which he gives them has a certain reasonable to us, a certain message to it. Let's begin with the first. We'll work our way through them. The first one, who, blessed or happy is the man who is poor in spirit. Why? Because he knows that he is spiritually bankrupt. What God is saying here, let me tell you who's blessed. 
the man who knows he's spiritually poor, or if you will, spiritually bankrupt. Such a man, as a man knows, he is, he's not in good standing before God. Now, lots of folks think they're in pretty good shape. Remember those two people praying? The tax collector was praying. The Pharisee, the Pharisee said, thank you, Lord, for not making me like this, this filthy tax player, tax, tax collector. Well, was he poor in spirit? No. Jesus said he, lost, he left the temple lost. The tax collector, on the other hand, was beating his chest and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He was poor in spirit. He knew he was spiritually bankrupt. He was poor in spirit, spiritually bankrupt. Jesus, he left saved. You understand what's going on here? So the poor in spirit are blessed because a man is because they know that they're spiritually bankrupt. Not only that, blessed is the man who mourns over his spiritual bankruptcy. You say, well, of course a man would mourn over his spiritual bankruptcy. Most people don't. The world is filled with people who sin a lot and know they're sinning because they know the Ten Commandments and don't care. It doesn't, they don't grieve about it. Do you think that the average who's promiscuous is upset about it? No. He's not upset about it. He's not mourning over it. He knows that, that adultery is or promiscuity is sinful. That sort of permeates the society. We sort of all know that. It's not like a big secret or anything. Admittedly, the Ten Commandments isn't as much a part of our culture as it once was, but most people know that sexual promiscuity, adultery, things like that are wrong. But the average person who's doing it doesn't mourning over it. So when Jesus says, blessed is the man who, is, uh, who mourns, he's saying, blessed is the man who is poor in spirit and grieves over being poor in spirit. It's not enough to know that you're poor in spirit, that you're spiritually bankrupt. You've got to grieve over it. And she says, that man, because now he's going to be on the way to salvation. You see where we're headed with this. And uh, so blessed is the man who, uh, who is poor in spirit because he knows he is spiritually bankrupt and who mourns over his spiritual bankruptcy because this leads to meekness. That means because he has nothing to be proud of. The man who is poor in spirit, grieves over being poor in spirit, uh, and is meek, He's meek because he knows he has nothing to be proud of. The world's filled with people who think very well of themselves, like the Pharisee we just talked about. So, follow this progression. Blessed is the man who's poor in spirit because he knows that he's spiritually bankrupt, who mourns over spiritual bankruptcy. This leads to meekness because he knows he has nothing to be proud of. When he's, he knows that when he stands before God, he's in deep trouble. As opposed to most of the world, they don't believe they're in deep trouble. And then finally... And then he, he hungers and thirsts for righteousness because he needs righteousness to walk with God. This is the man, the fourth step. And this is actually sort of a progression towards salvation. If a man knows he's poor in spirit, he grieves over it, knows he's bad, and uh, is meek because he knows he has nothing to be proud of because he stands with God, he's going to be in deep trouble. This is the sort of man that hungers and thirsts for righteousness because he looks at his life and says, I need the righteousness. I need righteousness. I need, if I'm going to walk with God, I have to have righteousness. So he hungers and thirsts for it. This is a man who's candidate for salvation. Let's continue. He will be merciful. He cries out to salvation for salvation. God gives him salvation. He's merciful. And what Jesus is saying, such a man will then himself be merciful because God was merciful to him. He will become pure in heart. Because he's Jesus is talking here about progressive sanctification. Once a man who's poor, in spirit, cried out for salvation. God saves him, mercifully saves him. He himself then will become merciful, and uh, he'll become pure in heart as he progresses in salvation. All of us are progressing in salvation, I mean in sanctification. You understand that? God, in Romans chapter 8, is telling us, and it's a wonderful passage, that God is conforming us to the image of Christ. Now, some of us are doing it faster than others. Some of us, it's hard to identify. <laughs> and there are times in our lives when we step back and sort of move in the other direction. But when you embrace Christ as your Savior, you're born again into the kingdom of God. Not only uh, is the cord that enslaved you to your sin nature broken, God gives you a new nature, His nature, and He gives you the indwelling, indwelling Holy Spirit, and you are progressively sanctified, whether you cooperate a lot or not. We are all being conformed, 
Paul wrote to the church in Rome. We're all being conformed to the image of Christ. So the point being here is that the man who cried out for mercy, God was merciful and saved him, and he will become pure in heart as he progresses in salvation. Continuing on, he will become a peacemaker. Blesses a man, he will be, this man, because he will become a peacemaker. But he's, when, 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 you know, this is one beatitude that world leaders love to quote, and they get it wrong every time. When they start talking about peacemakers, if, you, if, you, if, if for some reason the subject of the United Nations comes up, someone is bound, to, if there's a the sort of conference, someone is bound to quote this beatitude. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. And they think of the United Nations and organizations like that as being peacemakers. Now, I'm not opposed to making peace, folks. I'm not anti-peace. I wish all the warring nations would stop war, making war against each other. I'm totally in favor of it. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's not talking about the United Nations. He's not talking about world leaders are out making peace with other nations. He's not talking about making peace between feuding nations. What he's saying is we're talking about a man who comes to Christ for salvation. And he will become a peacemaker. Let me tell you, the biggest problem we have is men being at odds with God. So a, a peacemaker in God's kingdom is the man who leads this individual to Christ for salvation. When he does that, he is being a peacemaker because we as sinners are at odds with God. There is a hostility between the unbeliever and God. In fact, God calls the unbelievers his enemies. We are his enemies. We're at odds with him. But when a man comes to salvation, he's made peace with God. And the man who led him to salvation in Christ so he can make peace with God is a what? It's a peacemaker. So what Jesus is talking about here is the peacemaker. The man is a soul winner. Soul winners are the real peacemakers, not the United Nations. Well, that's another story. <laughs> so follow the progression. He will be merciful. The man who was poor in spirit cried out for mercy, was given mercy, brought to salvation. He will be merciful because God was merciful to him. He'll become pure in heart as he progresses in sanctification. He will become a peacemaker. Not between feuding families here on earth, but between individuals and God. And finally, he'll be persecuted, insulted, and hated because the world hates God's children. Blessed are you when men hate you. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute and say you all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, Jesus said, for great is your reward in heaven. Jesus called this man happy, called him blissful. And people say, wait a minute, he's getting persecuted. Yeah, for the few years you're persecuted here, you're going to have re be rewarded for that for trillions of years in eternity future. At this point in our lives, it's hard to see. I don't like persecution. I, I mean, masochism has never been a thing for me. But having said that, I recognize what Jesus was getting at. Right now, it may seem tough. You're being persecuted and there are parts of this country, think of Nigeria, where they're, they're, these, the Boko Haram is, 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 is capturing those, those schoolgirls. And in, in China, they're be, Christians are being persecuted. And in lots of Muslim countries, they're being persecuted. Here in the United States, we're being persecuted as well uh, in, the, in the public square, in the square of ideas. So try to be an evangelical at a college or university, and you won't get tenure if you're a teacher. It's hard. Some do, but it's very, very difficult. Uh, but, so you're persecuted now, but blessed are you, Jesus says. Why? Because great is your reward in heaven. So, these are our eight Beatitudes. What Jesus is saying in the Beatitudes is this. Let me tell you who the really blessed men and women are. Or if you will, let me tell you whom God will really bless. I know that what I'm saying going to be saying about them will not make much sense to those in this world, but what I'm saying is nevertheless true. To understand what I'm saying require an eternal perspective. And let me say this, much of Christianity makes no sense without an eternal perspective. But eternal perspective has got to be, you've got to get a hold of it, because that's what we are. We're men and women of eternity. You're going to spend eternity with heaven, or you're going to spend eternity in hell. You're stuck with eternity. And so what Jesus is doing is telling you how to prepare for it. So to understand what I'm saying will require an eternal perspective. But keep this in mind. One day, an eternal perspective will be the only perspective anyone will have. All right. 
the order of Beatitudes, really, as I've just gone through, moves us from salvation to godliness. If the first four Beatitudes speak about those coming to salvation. You must begin with being poor in spirit. That is, you know you're in deep trouble. Grieving over it, you care about being spiritually bankrupt. This leads to meekness. You know you have nothing to be proud of. You're not going to be like that Pharisee who was very proud of himself. Well, he was actually a hopeless sinner who left lost. Uh, he, he wasn't meek. He was the antithesis of being meek. So coming to salvation begins with being poor in spirit, knowing you're spiritually bankrupt, and it grieves you. You mourn over it. This leads to meekness. That is, you know that you have nothing to be proud of, and you begin hungering and thirst for righteousness because you know you need to be righteous to walk with God, to spend eternity with Him. You cry out for salvation. God mercifully brings you salvation, and because God is merciful to you, you will become merciful, and you will progressively become pure in heart. You will become a soul winner, which makes you a peacemaker because you're bringing individuals to to God, to, to making peace with God. And unfortunately, but fortunately, you'll be persecuted, insulted, hated. These are the Beatitudes. We're going to spend time on each of them, but I wanted to give you the big picture of how they all sort of fit together. It's amazing the way the Lord put these things together. All right, let's look at the first Beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The world says, blessed are the rich. <laughs> Jesus says, blessed are the poor. Are, are we at odds with the world or what? Jesus says the way to riches is through poverty. What does Jesus not mean by being poor in spirit? Let me list, list some things he does not mean. He is not referring to material poverty. The Bible does not denounce material poverty. The, the Christians out there who act like God does, and they, it's because they misinterpret the sermon, on, the sermon on the Mount and these Beatitudes. God is not praising poverty, or material poverty. Nowhere in the Bible does God denounce riches. In fact, some of the finest men in the Bible were rich. So it's okay to be rich. I'm not up here preaching prosperity gospel. Keep that in mind. The Bible does not denounce wealth. And the truth is, it doesn't esteem poverty. But if you get the sense in our culture that the poor are virtuous and the rich are villains. Have you ever noticed that? How many politicians have you ever heard run on the platform of being good to the rich? None. In fact, they vilify the rich. On the other hand, they run on the platform of helping the poor. They make virtues make the poor virtuous. The truth is, I've known a lot of poor people who weren't virtuous at all. And I've known some rich people who are quite virtuous. So the Bible is not anti-rich. So what Jesus is not talking about here is, is material poverty. It's also, many, as I point out, great saints were rich. And if, as one man pointed out, I love this, if being materially poor was a blessing, it would be wrong to help the poor. And uh, no one thinks it's wrong to help the poor. So... Jesus was not referring to material poverty. He's not referring to being weak or lacking courage, weak in character or lacking courage. There is no virtue in possessing these character flaws. Jesus is not referring to material poverty. He's not re referring to being weak in character or lacking courage. He's not referring to being poor spirited. He's, there's no virtue in lacking vigor and ambition and drive and enthusiasm for life. Some people tend to think so, but there, there's no virtue in that. And he's not referring to a humble demeanor. I, uh, anytime, I, every time I read this, I think about uh, Charles Dickens' uh, uh, David Copperfield. You remember that? And there was a fellow in there named Uriah Heep. And Uriah Heep loved to go around sort of bent over like this and say, I'm, I'm an humble man. He never pronounces the H. He wouldn't say humble, but he would say, I'm an humble man, I'm an humble man, I'm an humble man. So, uh, actually, he was the antithesis of being humble. He was a scoundrel and a con man. He was the opposite. He was full of pride. But he loved to put on that demeanor. And I've noticed over the years, some Christians like putting it on. It can be a little fakey. Uh, and that's not what Jesus, because they probably think, I'm supposed to be poor in spirit, I'm supposed to have a humble demeanor. 
that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's not referring to a humble or recessive demeanor like Uriah Heepin Dickens, David Carterfield. What does Jesus mean by being poor in spirit? Well, it's a recognition of one's own spiritual poverty. That's what he's talking about. The man who's poor in spirit is the man who knows. We're all poor in spirit. Just a bunch of us don't recognize it. And the man, what Jesus is talking about here, is the man who recognizes his own spiritual poverty. The man who is, is poor in spirit recognizes that he is spiritually bankrupt, that he has failed to measure up to God's standard of righteousness, that he is therefore condemned. Jesus said, blessed is this man, happy is this man, because this is the first step on the road to salvation. So kudos for this guy. Pink wrote, Poverty of spirit is the opposite of that haughty, self-assertive, and self-sufficient disposition which the world so much admires and praises. It is the very reverse of that independent and defiant attitude which refuses to bow to God, which determines to brave things out, which says with Pharaoh, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? To be poor in spirit is to realize that I have nothing, I am nothing, I can do nothing, and am in need of all things. Brand that on your brain. That's what being poor in spirit is all about. I have nothing. I am nothing. I can do nothing. I am in need of all things. The opposite of the, pub, of the uh, Pharisee who was praying in the temple. Poverty of spirit is a consciousness of my emptiness. It is the result of the Spirit's work within. It issues from the painful discovery that all my righteousnesses are as filthy rags. It follows the awakening that my best performances are unacceptable, yea, an abomination to the thrice holy one. Poverty of spirit evidences itself by its bringing the individual into dust before God, acknowledging his utter helplessness and his deservingness of hell. A powerful statement, brand that. This is what being poor in spirit is all about. It's the opposite of saying, Loving yourself, admiring yourself, having confidence in yourself, which that attitude about self is so much a part of our culture. Our culture teaches us to think we're wonderful. We teach kids in school to think they're wonderful. They can do anything they want to do. Right away, that's not logical. You can, you know, if, if, you want, if you believe in yourself, you can make it. If you just have faith, you can make it. Well, we all want to be president of the United States next year. Okay, how's that going to work for us? Well, I mean, kind of, there's, there's a lot of absurdities inside. Some of them, you know, uh, absurdities in our culture, absurd ideas, many of which you don't even need to be a Christian to know the Bible and know are absurd. So in any event, this is a powerful statement. What does Jesus mean by being poor in spirit? It's a recognition of one's own spiritual poverty. A man who is poor in spirit recognizes that he is spiritually bankrupt, that he has failed to measure up to God's standard of righteousness, and that he is therefore condemned. And everybody ought to feel this way. Because if you don't, you have a problem. Yeah, they, they like to talk about self-image. Well, this is, your self, this is the self-image that you should have. This is the self-image you should have. Not the self-image that's just the opposite of this. All right. What is poverty? Why is poverty of spirit necessary? It's a prerequisite to salvation. If if I don't if 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 I think I'm in good shape, why am I coming to God for help? Why am I crying out for salvation? I'm not. No one enters the kingdom of God on the basis of pride. The doorway to heaven is very low and must be crawled through. You must humble yourself. It leads to this having poverty of spirit leads to a correct understanding of self. This man knows that he is clothed in filthy rags. It leads to a correct understanding of God. The man who has appreciated, this man has an appreciation of the matchless worth of Christ. The man who recognizes that he is poor in spirit, that he's totally bankrupt, that his righteousness is filthy rags, he has nothing, he can do nothing, he's totally dependent upon God, is the man that will glory in appreciating what Christ has done for him. He took, this is the man who recognizes that Christ took his filthiness, his filthy rags, and took them upon himself and died for them. So, Having poverty of spirit not only gives me a correct understanding of myself, it gives me a correct understanding of what God has done for me. This is not very self-affirming. You understand that. This doesn't fit into our culture. Why is poverty of spirit necessary? 
I can think of one church, the church of Laodicea in the book of Revelation. This is what God had to say. You say, I am rich. You think you're wonderful. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked, and that's who we all are. We may think we're wonderful, rich, and not in need of anything like that Pharisee. He, I didn't need, he didn't need anything. He was bragging about himself before God. God could just as easily have been looking at him and saying, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. He needed a good dose of poverty of spirit, that fellow. The results of a man recognizing that he's poor in spirit, he will take Christ on his own terms because he knows he is doomed. Lord, he will cry out, what would you, what would you have me do? Excuse me. What would you have me do? When a man realizes he has nothing to negotiate with, what would you have me do, Lord? What would you have me do? He will take Christ in his own terms. He will be esteemed by God. God says this. This is the one I esteem. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Psalm 34. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. This is the man who's poor in spirit. God esteems him. This is the man who knows who he is. And he recognizes that God is so much more. Psalm 51, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh, God, you will not despise. Isaiah 57, but this is what the high and lofty one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. You get the idea. We can go on and on and on. Who does God love? He loves the man who's got a handle on himself and his own poverty of spirit. This is the man who then, and it, part of that whole process is because he looked at the righteousness of God, sees the enormous gap, and God says, this is the man I esteem. The way up is what? Down. The way up is down. The results of a man recognizing that he is poor in spirit, he will take Christ in his own terms. He will be esteemed by God. He will inherit the kingdom of God. Not a bad deal, folks. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All right. We can do one more. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the next beatitude is blessed, number two, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Jesus began the beatitudes by saying, the way to riches is through poverty. And now he says the way to comfort is through mourning. This speaks of mourning because of personal sin. King David mourned over his personal sin. If you look at the great men in Scripture, great women in Scripture, they grieved over their sinful behavior. Today, we live in a culture where men write books in which they brag about their bad behavior. I, I can't tell you how many books have been written by celebrities, in particular athletes, who like to brag about the number of women they betted. Men like to write, and women like to write, about their sinful behavior. See, what Jesus says, that's not a blessed man. The blessed man is not only knows he's spiritually bankrupt, but over it. I've sinned. How many national figures do you know that grieve publicly over their sinful behavior? They make excuses for their sinful behavior. They brag about their sinful behavior. They brag, every, every, practically every Democrat running for office brags about being pro-choice. What he's bragging about is murdering babies and supporting women's right to murder babies. How many of them brag about uh, being, uh, being pro-LBGTQ? About half the country brags about supporting sinful behavior. In fact, it's reached a point now where not only do they brag about supporting sinful behavior, they attack those who attack sinful behavior. But the man Jesus is talking about, the blessed man, the happy man, the man who's going to make it in the kingdom of God, not only knows he's spiritually bankrupt, he grieves over it. He's not bragging about his sinful behavior. He's grieving over his personal sin. King David mourned over his personal sins. Oh, Lord, do not rebuke me. Rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. For your arrows have pierced me and your hand has come down upon me. Because of your wrath, there is no health in my body. My bones have no soundness because of my sin. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and are loathsome because of my sinful folly. 
I am bowed down and brought very low. All day long I go about mourning. My back is filled with searing pain. There is no health in my body. I am feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in anguish of heart. David goes on and on. Was he upset about his sinful behavior? Oh, he was. How does that fit in our culture? People brag about it. It's the most amazing thing. The woman who lived a sinful life. This is one amazing woman. Now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Was she grieving over her sinful life? You bet. She was a candidate for salvation. The tax collector who mourned over his personal sins. To some who were confident of their own righteousness. There's a man who's bragging about his sinful behavior. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. We've talked about this before. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you. I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fist twice, twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. He was happy with himself. No poverty of spirit there. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, Jesus said, this man rather than the other went to heaven justified before God. One was, knew he was spiritually bankrupt and grieved over it. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Peter Great example, someone grieving over sinful behavior. He wept bitterly after he denied the Lord three times. Then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. What a poignant moment in this precious brother's life. The Israelites are going to weep on the, weep, wept on the day of Pentecost. When the people heard Peter's sermon about Jesus, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles' brothers, what shall we do? 3,000 came to salvation that day. Why? Because they knew they were bankrupt. They blew it. They grieved over it and cried out for mercy. You see the process that we're going through here? The Israelites on the day the Lord returns. It's one of my favorite passages. Zechariah, and I will pour out God said to Zechariah, I will pour out in the house of David and in the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me. This is talking about the Lord's return at the end of the tribulation. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. When Jesus Christ returns to earth, Israel will have been regathered. They're already regathered. And they will see him return. They will grieve. They will mourn. Why? Because they will know in a flash that they sacrificed this precious one, their Messiah. And it, it grieves them. So this speaks of mourning. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. This speaks of mourning because of personal sin. King David mourned over his personal sins. The woman who lived a sinful life mourned over her personal sins. The tax collector mourned over his personal sins. Peter wept bitterly. The Israelites mourned over their sins on the day of Pentecost. The Israelites, on the day of the Lord's return to earth, will mourn. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. This speaks of mourning because of personal sin. There's also mourning because of the horrors of the sinful end. Uh, we've read some examples of individuals mourning over their personal sinful behavior. But there's also men and women in the scriptures who mourned over the, the, the horrors of a sinful end. I hope you mourn. I know many of you do. Mourn over the sinful behavior of this horrible world. Micah wept over the destruction of the ten northern tribes. Because of this, he wrote, I will weep and wail. I will go about barefoot and naked. I will howl like a jackal and moan like an... This man was upset because the ten northern tribes were going to be destroyed by the Assyrians. Jeremiah wept over the destruction of Jerusalem. In fact, he wrote a whole book uh, called Lamentations in which he wept over the destruction of Jerusalem. My eyes, he wrote, fail from weeping. I am in torment within. My heart is poured out on the ground because my people are destroyed, because children and infants faint in the streets of the city. The whole creation, incidentally, mourns because of the curse. Romans 8, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. 
Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. This speaks of mourning because of personal sins. This also speaks of mourning because of the horrors of a sinful work. Now, now notice what Jesus wants is for us to take hold of these ideas and mourn. You should mourn over your personal sins. And you should mourn over a world steeped in sin and all the pain and the suffering that goes along with it. But most of all, the sinful world is an affront to an, a holy God. That ought to break your heart. There's a strong connection in the scriptures between mourning and comfort. I love this. For his anger, that's God's anger at us, lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. I love that. This is one of the, my, the, my verses I usually end up in funeral services. Uh, I do, do a lot of funerals. Pastors and and uh, as the congregation gets older, there'll be more. But one of my favorite verses at a funeral is this passage from Psalm 30. His anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. You know why rejoicing comes in the morning? Because you have a merciful and gracious God. So this can refer to a death, so you haven't done the same. It can also refer to the greater meaning, I think, is because of your sinful behavior. You blew it. You blew it big time. You're weeping over it. You cry out to God for mercy. What comes in the morning? Joy. I like that. I, who, does everybody like joy? I like joy. Psalm 126, those who saw, sow in tears, will, re, will reap with songs of joy. So, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. This speaks of mourning because of personal sin. There's also mourning because of the horrors of a sinful work. There's a strong connection between mourning and comfort. And God promises to comfort the grieving. God promises to comfort the grieving. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. That will end it. We'll, we'll pick up. Aren't these Beatitudes amazing? They're really quite amazing. Don't forget the order in which God gave them because he's trying to tell a story there. But he doesn't want us to lose insight into each one of these Beatitudes because each speaks of an attitude we need to embrace. They're paradoxical to, to us. They're insane to the world, but they're true. Father, we love you, we worship you, and we thank you again for being our God and loving us. Thank you for the instructions you give us. Thank you for helping us to learn to live lives that are pleasing to you. And we do, my brothers and sisters in this room, we do grieve over the sin that reigns in the world. Father, please come in the person of your Son to rule the world and put an end to it. In the meantime, encourage us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.